Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome. Uh, my name is Sean Michael Morris, and I'm the VP of Academics at Course Hero. I'm very excited to welcome you to the, uh, to the webinar, Elevate Your Teaching Productivity with Gen AI, which will be led by Jeremy Kaplan. This webinar is the first in an ongoing series of offerings from Course Hero on the subject of Gen AI in education. We hope this session will inspire you to share ideas with one another, explore new ways to engage with AI on your own, and take some of your learnings back to your colleagues. Throughout the webinar, we'll welcome questions, comments, and feedback in the chat. Um, we'll also have the Q&A um, available. Um, and also feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to contribute to the conversation. We do run these webinars a little bit differently. As you can see, everyone's on screen. Um, we'd like this to be a community sort of event. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Jeremy Kaplan. Jeremy is a director of teaching and learning at CUNY's Newmark Graduate School of Journal Journalism in New York City, where he and his colleagues are helping train a new generation of journalists. He also leads the school's Entrepreneurial Journalism Creators Program, a 100-day online program that has helped more than 100 journalists from 37 countries start up new niche ventures since the start of the pandemic. He writes the Wonder Tools newsletter, where he shares useful digital sites and apps, including many for teaching. And then we'll uh, drop a link uh, to his newsletter in the chat for folks who are curious. And with that, I'll hand the mic and the stage to you, Jeremy. Welcome. Thank you, Sean, and thanks to everyone for joining. I am super, super delighted to be here with you all. This is a, an exciting topic. It's very much top of mind for many of us who are teaching in this ever-evolving world. I want to start with a quick warm-up poll uh, to just get the, the feel of the room and to, to uh, begin to, to connect with one another. Uh, this is just a quick pulse check. How, how are you feeling at the moment? All of us coming to this at the end of the week from all sorts of other stuff that we're we're doing, all sorts of stuff we're teaching, thinking about, working on. What's the, what's the the feeling that you have? You'll see a on the screen a QR code. You can actually put your camera right up to the QR code and just answer with a word on your phone, um, nice and easy. You'll see how students do this too in uh, in online contexts. And in addition to to that, you can also just use the link uh, that should be in the uh, in the chat um, for the. QR code um, uh, for, for to to join the uh, the Slido that uh, Lily just just shared that link. So I see um, we've got people feeling tired. We've got people feeling excited um, and feeling good. Some people feeling overwhelmed. Uh, some just okay. Some phenomenal. Some drained. Uh, however you're feeling, that's all good. We bring all sorts of different feelings and energy to the room. My hope is that you come away with at least one actionable, useful insight that you can use in your teaching. This is not just for theoretical purposes, this is for practical benefits. So my hope is that you will come away from today feeling like, oh, I've got something I can actually do. I've got something I can use. I'm gonna implement this in my teaching. And if you do, then this is a success and time well spent. So so that's our objective here uh, for today. And thanks to everyone for, for chiming in. This is gonna be um, largely a session where I share ideas, information, insights, examples. However, I want to give you an opportunity to engage at a few points throughout. So if you do that, um, I think it'll be more enjoyable and more effective um, for, for all of us. And with that, I'm going to actually jump into another poll. Um, I see more, more words here, curious, um, energized, uh, decent, uh, happy Friday. I see lots of lots of different feelings here. We can, can jump into a couple other quick polls now that you've got it up on your screen. Um, I'm curious where you teach, if you teach online, um, in person, or some form of both. Um, so where where is your uh, teaching taking place? Let's see where people are at in the room. And I'll give you a moment to to uh, to fill that in. Looks like uh, a lot of folks are teaching in both contexts. So a lot of these tools will be useful in both contexts. And um, some of you are teaching purely online or mainly online. Some of you are teaching uh, a quarter of you. About a quarter of people here are teaching uh, primarily in person, and then uh, the the vast remaining majority. Are, um, are teaching in both, about two thirds are teaching both online and in person. And one of the benefits to the tools that I'm using and, and gonna share with you are that they really work in both, both those contexts as well as um, in hybrid contexts. And when, you, um, when, when we think about AI, how much have you actually already used it? Um, have you already used AI quite a lot, uh, just a little bit or, or maybe not at all? I'll give the rest of you a moment to 
to share that. It looks like about a quarter, between a quarter and a third, have uh, about a quarter have not used it at all. So this is a first opportunity. This hopefully will be a chance for you to see why why it's worth exploring or at least considering exploring. Everyone's going to make their own choice as to how they use it, if they use it, when they use it. Um, some of you, uh, almost a fifth, have used it quite a lot. So feel free to chime in, in the chat, help others who are here uh, identify examples of how you found it useful and maybe caveats um, where it's less useful or where it's problematic. Um, and, and a majority of people, a little more than half are, are people who've used it just a little bit. So hopefully you can build on the, 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 the stuff you've already done and, and add some new, new ideas and new use cases to your toolkit. Couple more quick ones. When you think of AI, what's the word that, or phrase that comes to mind? What's, what's the association that you have when you think of AI, which is the subject of our, our session today? What's the word that comes to mind? A quick word or, or phrase that comes to mind. iRobot, the Isaac Asimov series, helpful, cheating, efficient, efficiency, um, shortcut, time saver, potential, wow, somebody writes, disruptive, generative, mediocre texts, right? There's some positive sentiments here, some cautious or negative sentiments, some otherwise optimization, transformative opportunity, plagiarism, developing quickly, uncertainty, how, reference to the, the movie, uh, misunderstood, okay, that's interesting, and uh, support, optimization. Those are the kinds of things that I'm going to focus on for today. We're not going to delve into complicated philosophical debates or um, or or speculative discussions about what might happen in the future. That will happen plenty online. There'll be a lots of other spaces for those kinds of ethical debates as well. I'm focusing on actionable, useful ways that we as instructors can explore capitalizing on the benefits of AI. And I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, and, and then one final question here, um, because this is gonna lead us to our, our next uh, step, which is diving into the, the presentation. Um, where, where, where do you learn most? What, what, what do you learn most from? Um, seeing examples, trying things out, hearing an explanation. What's, what's your quick, quick thought on what's, what's most relevant, most useful for you as a learner? We're all educators here. Many of us are at least. Um, it's useful for us to think on a meta level about how we actually learn in sessions like this or in our teaching in general and our learning in general. Um, looks like most people are saying trying things out. And the majority, almost three quarters, a quarter are saying seeing examples and just a small number are saying hearing explanation. It's so interesting because what we're here to do is to do all three of those things. Um, and what you're hopefully gonna do afterwards is try these things out, right? So I'm gonna share a bunch of things with you in the coming uh, moments we have together. And then I'm gonna encourage you to really explore and pick one thing, one specific thing that you can uh, try out and, and uh, really, really delve into as your own specific next action step. And with that in mind, I'm going to dive into uh, my slides and shift gears here on the screen share. And feel free to jump in with Q&A along the way. I'm going to break about halfway through and then at the end for answering some questions. If there's something that's really pressing, um, feel free to, um, to draw that to my attention um, by putting your hand up. But otherwise, I'm going to uh, pause, as I said, halfway through and then and then again uh, toward the end for, for Q&A. So um, we can do a little another little response test. You can use the responses on your um, on your on your uh, Zoom to indicate that you can see the slides and you can hear me OK and everything's good on that front. And and uh, I assume I'll, I'll hear from you otherwise if you can't. So um, I'm going to dive in. So this is about elevating our teaching productivity, right? That's our focus for today, specifically by using AI. And we're going to specifically talk about these areas in particular. So how can we create, for example, learning outcomes? How can we refine the learning outcomes that we are drafting for our syllabi? How can we actually put together a draft of a syllabi? Um, how can we put together lesson plans, rubrics more efficiently? Now, I want to say right up front, because some people may have this question already in their mind, this is not replacing us. This is augmenting our skills, our insights, our intelligence, our capabilities, right? Just in the same way we use a thesaurus, not to replace our brains or our writing, but to augment our capabilities, right? To augment the ways in which we choose words. We use a thesaurus or a dictionary, right? To augment the way that we 
craft or writing, we use a word processor, right? So these are tools just like other tools that we've been accustomed to in the past. Tools, of course, when they first come out, they're sometimes scary, right? The phonograph was going to obliterate people's ability to sing was the concern people had, right, historically. All kinds of innovations in technology have been forecast as the end of civilization, the doom of all things good. And I think we have to be a little bit more sober in how we assess and analyze and examine what the tools can do and what they can be useful for. Um, and so in our case, these tools are not, again, replacing what we're doing. They're augmenting our skill and, and, and adding to our efficiency. We as teachers are called on to do so much, right? I can't speak for everyone here. I can just speak for myself, my own experience. There's a lot of roles we play in terms of our, our um, duties as, as educators. And I don't have to enumerate those because you know what they are. You live those, many of you. So in order to work at our best and to have time to, to spend time individually with students and to do our creative teaching and thinking about teaching and dreaming up new ways to teach and dreaming up new courses and teaching our our, our day to day uh, classes as effectively as possible, we sometimes want to use tools to gain efficiencies. And that's really what this this uh, session is focused on. So in addition to those materials that we generally plan, um, use before preparing for class, uh, um, generating outcomes, syllabi, lesson plans, rubrics. We also we also generate things that are useful in class, in live teaching, like analogies that we're going to use for explaining things, examples that we use in our teaching, assessments, questions, formative assessment questions that we ask to gauge, check for understanding, right? Um, and other activities that we're going to use to make class engaging, right? We want learning to be efficient and effective and enjoyable. So we want active learning, not just lecturing, right? Not just preparing dry materials, but preparing active activities. So we can actually use AI to generate ideas for in-class activities and to augment our creativity in that respect. And we'll get to that as well. And the third thing we'll touch on toward the end is about multimedia. How can we use AI to generate even more engaging visual materials, multimedia? And how can we use AI to do translation for students who need translated materials or to translate research that we want to apply in the classroom? How can we transcribe and summarize class sessions for those students who we need to include and may have physical disabilities or differences in learning styles or, um, or um, neurodivergences, et cetera? So all of these are areas where we can use AI for inclusion, for, um, for the sake of adding efficiency to our work and for many other purposes. And in terms of what I will offer you today, explanations, how this works, what you can use, some examples of tools. Some examples, I'll show you some examples of how I've used AI and talk through how you can use AI in your own um, way. And then some exercises. So it'll be a couple of chances for you to engage. Now, because I wanna share as much as possible today, we won't spend time in workshop mode throughout, right? Because that would um, limit the amount of um, information and, and ideas I can share with you. However, I'm gonna encourage you a couple of times to try something out. And if you wanna try things out along the way, if that's how you learn best, please feel free, dive in, try things as I'm describing them, try them out on your own browser on your own laptop. And if not, if not, if you prefer to try them afterwards, go for it, carve out an hour, set aside an hour for yourself and try out some of these things on your own, apply them to your own teaching. Just a couple words about me. I read the Wonder Tools newsletter. It's a weekly newsletter. Uh, talk about AI a lot. And so the tools I'm gonna talk about today, if you want more about them, if you wanna dive in deeper, um, you can read that newsletter for free. It's Wonder Tools substack.com. I also run the Journalism Creators Program. I help journalists around the world to create new ventures, including graduate students here at CUNY, the City University of New York, and um, independent journalists around the world, 37 different countries um, in the past couple of years alone. So, And that's a fully online program. So that's a little bit of my context. Um, and and I've, I've found that the AI is helpful for me in teaching more efficiently and hopefully more effectively and hopefully more enjoyably for the students and for the participants. And I've also found that for a lot of individual teachers I work with as director of teaching here at the, at the Graduate School of Journalism, that teachers find that it opens up time for them. So again, it doesn't replace them. It doesn't prevent them from having to do their work. It, it instead augments what they can actually do. And, and I wanna make clear that, that this is not a matter of choice, really. It's not something we can put back in the box. Uh, almost all the tools we use are going to have AI built in if they don't already. That that includes even tools like Google Docs, right? Google Search, right? They already have AI, Microsoft Word. Any tool that you're familiar with, it will have if it doesn't already have AI built in. So we can't hide from that or hope it disappears any more than we can hope that, you know, other tools we use like word processors or thesaurus or calculators will disappear. That's just the reality of our, of our teaching. 
um, and the world we live in. So our objective instead is to focus on how can we capitalize on, on AI to serve student needs, right? We're in, we, we work in service of students and we want to deepen learning. One topic I will not get into today in great depth because there are many other contexts and forms for it is uh, is focus on student use of AI for, for potentially plagiaristic uses and so forth. That's an important and really significant topic. And in the Q&A, if, if someone's got a question about that, I'm happy to address it. But in general, there's a lot of other forms where people are discussing that. So I wanna focus instead on how we as teachers, right? How we can make use of some of these tools and give you some options to see if there's one that might be relevant or feel good for you. Um, we're in this new era, as I mentioned, right? We're no longer in the Microsoft Word era. We're no longer even in the in the cloud or early Google Docs era. I still remember the first time I used Google Docs, right? We're instead in this new fourth era, right? Um, which is really where AI becomes a, a practical tool. And again, the question is, how do we use it and where do we use it? We're not going to use it in every context. We're going to pick and choose those contexts. And I'm going to share with you some examples. The main objective, again, is to open up time for engaging with students through creative teaching, through one-on-one -on -one meetings, through providing our own personalized human feedback. That's what we're opening up time for. So that's that's what we don't want to do with AI, right? Um, but we can use AI for some surprising things in addition to some efficiencies. We can use AI to say to ourselves, what am I missing? So here's a lesson plan I have, and I'm going to paste it into paste part of it into AI or summarize it. What am I missing? What might my blind spots be? Or this is the way I'm describing this topic. These are the examples I'm using for this topic. What might my blind spots be? Where might I have unconscious bias? What might I, whose voice may I have left out in this material? So I wanna challenge the idea that it's purely about efficiency. I think it's also about creativity. It's also about pushing us to be more inclusive and more broad-minded in ways that can challenge our own biases or our own uh, limitations. The four tools that I'm gonna encourage people to explore if you haven't yet, and you can dive into one of these even right now. I think we'll have them in the chat, a link to some of these. Um, ChatGPT, Claude, Bing AI, and BART. And just very briefly, without getting into too much detail, these I'm focusing on now because they're iterative AI tools. So general word processing tools like uh, Word or Google Docs or Notion or Coda or Craft, all of these tools have AI built in, but generally, you ask the AI to write something, it writes something for you, and, and basically it stops there. It's not iterative based. Whereas with chat-based AI tools like Claude, ChatGPT, Bing AI, and Bard, you can iterate. So typically the process that I'm going to suggest to you is we start with an idea, an objective, what we're trying to do, and we get an initial result, but then we iterate, then we refine it. Then we say, well, actually, my class is different in this way, right? I only have 60 minutes, not 90 minutes or not three hours or my class is conducted in this language, or my class is a flipped classroom, or it's hybrid. So we can iterate on the guidance that we're getting from the AI. And that's that's an important distinction from just the flat use of AI. ChatGPT is the classic one, and it remains great. One of the advantages it has is lots and lots of plugins. So you can use ChatGPT with other tools to augment what ChatGPT can do. Um, one of the advantages of Claude is that you can use it for up to 70,000 words, right? So you can put in an entire research study and ask questions, engage with it, right? Try to learn from a document by putting larger amounts of text into Claude. Bing AI is nice in the sense that it's connected to the Bing web search so that you can actually verify, try to verify some of the things that it's providing to you if you're, if you're using it in, in a context where there are facts. And in general, I use it as a language engine, not as a fact engine. In other words, I'm not using it like I would use Google, right? It's not, it's not because of the hallucination problem, right? It's gonna give you things that aren't true. So instead you're using it for other purposes, which I'll get to as we go. But one of the things that's nice about Bing is it's connected to a search engine. And that's true of BARD as well. So BARD now, just as of this week, BARD is Google's answer to ChatGPT, right? It's Google's AI tool. Just this week, Bard now has a function where you can click a button and it will essentially fact check anything it's giving you. And it, and it will do that by basically putting in green the things that it has uh, relevant web pages that help verify, right? And you can check whether those in fact do verify it. And then it will put in a different color, in a brown kind of color, uh, facts that it can't find, that it thinks may be hallucinated, right? So that's a nice support that's now moving us past this initial era of hallucination. It's not solving the problem entirely, but it's moving us to a little bit of progress. So again, if you wanna test out some of the things I'm gonna show along, along the way, 
feel free to to use one of these tools. They're all free, um, and um, encourage you to to explore. First thing I'm gonna I'm gonna dive into some examples now. Um, and first I just want to see if there are uh, questions. The Slido elements um, can be saved. I, I I will be happy to um, maybe include those in in post session materials. Um, generative AI tools use a lot, lot of water. That's a question I'll come back to um, later. Okay, so draft learning objectives. Um, first, how do we actually use the AI? How do we engage with it? What's the process? So first we envision something. So in this case, I'm gonna envision, I want a stronger set of learning objectives. I don't just wanna say that I want students to understand this and I want the students to be able to explain that. I wanna say it in sharper language, I want stronger, clear language. And I don't want to spend two hours racking my brain, right, or just Googling to random other places. I want to actually get a little guidance and collaborate with an AI assistant, right? The AI is essentially acting as an assistant, just like an intern might, just like someone that supports you might, if we were fortunate or wealthy enough to have assistants and interns all the time, right? This is essentially a digital version of that. So we're going to check its work. It's not, we're not going to use its work by itself. We're going to use it to in collaboration with our own ideas. So we envision something. So I want a clear set of outcomes for this course I'm teaching. I want to say them sharply, concisely, efficiently, and I want to include that in my syllabus. So I start with that envision. Then I go to the prompt. And in the prompt, I have to use some constraints. So this is the level I'm teaching. I'm teaching graduate students who are new to the subject. And um, my primary objectives are, and I'm going to give, give a kind of just a general description, right? Just lay, lay person's terms or just describe it in my own words, right? So again, I'm not asking the AI to come up with it for me. I'm coming up with it. I'm just using some casual language and the AI is going to help me sharpen that and refine it. Then I'm going to iterate it. So once I get a result from the AI, I'm going to say, okay, good. But, you know, there's another thing that's not included in this list so far. Please add this and reconstruct the list or please refine the list. These are too wordy or this sounds too formal where this sounds too informal. And I'm going to iterate on that. And then I'm going to humanize it, right? Once I get the result, then I'm going to use it as a draft, just like if I had tasked an intern or a collaborator or an assistant to, to give me a draft of something. I'm going to then humanize it, put it in my own words, and, and improve it. So here's a specific example to make this more real. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm asking this in this case to, I'm asking the AI to, um, to help me with an introductory writing course. This is not an actual course that I teach, by the way. I'm just stepping into that role for the moment. Um, so this is an introductory writing course for first-year college students. The course focuses on helping students strengthen their skills in informative writing, persuasive writing, et cetera, okay? I'm not going to read you the whole thing. I'm just going to give you a gist of it. And then I'm asking it, please help me create a clear draft of a set of learning objectives for the course that are measurable. Um, and then I thought of additional element. I said, please include so you can statements, right? So I may want to uh, frame it in a certain way. Um, so that students know what the benefit to them is, right? So you can craft clear and compelling informative text, right? So I give it this, this kind of initial question. Actually, let me give you a, a little closer view. This is the question that I posed. Now, not all prompts, of course, have to be this detailed, right? You could start with a much shorter prompt and, and, uh, and, and, and then iterate, right? Then add elements. But I've done this a bit and I wanted to just put all that up front, right, right from the top of my mind, right? Notice I added an element at the end. And to the extent possible, use Bloom's taxonomy higher order verbs to ensure these align with how we approach structuring our learning outcomes, right? So I can give it really specific technical kinds of teaching or pedagogy terms, and it understands that. It knows what that means, and it understands that and applies that. So what I get is, and you can judge for yourself the quality of this work. And again, this isn't the end product, right? You're going to end, you're going to humanize it further. You're going to edit it or polish it. I think these results tend to be pretty good. Again, I'll leave you to ju judge that for yourself. Um, these examples will be in the ebook that I wrote on this topic that is available to you after this. And you can see it gives me analyze, evaluate, apply strategies for, create texts, exhibiting, blah, blah, blah. And, it, and each one ends with, so you can contribute meaningful writing in an academic context, right? Or so you can write coherent essays relevant to your field of study, right? So it's really quite, quite helpful to me to now have this as a starting point. I can re refine it again or improve it, but I'm, I've now saved myself quite a bit of time. And I think these are gonna be even more effective than if I had just done this solo. I can add other things like, you know, you will demonstrate that. I can, I can sort of suggest words or I can give it further guidance into how it does this. Um, I can give it my existing learning objectives or learning outcomes and give it specific guidance, like make sure that 80% of these verbs are such and such, right? So you can be as, as 
um, dogmatic or as specific or as precise in your instructions as you'd like, or as vague and iterate. These are examples that I used in another context. This is entrepreneurial journalism, which is some, something I teach. So I gave it some, some, uh, some general direction and it came up with some specific, again, takeaways, learning outcomes. Now, maybe I wanna build that, build on that. I don't know how many of you have to create a syllabus from time and time to time, but I find it hard to start from complete scratch, right? That piece of paper is blank. It's gonna take me many, many hours. And as I've said before, this is not replacing, it's not creating it for you, it's helping you augment your work and doing it more efficiently. So here's an example. I, I teach uh, volunteer classes on classical music. I used to be a violinist. So I asked it to create a syllabus about um, the history of uh, European chamber music, classical chamber music. And I gave it some direction because I knew, you know, I wanted it to include certain composers. I wanted it to, you know, stick to the 18th to 20th centuries. Um, I added the, the mention of learning, learning outcomes using Bloom's taxonomy. And I added um, a suggestion about a draft assignment I wanted to be, include in the syllabus. So I gave it as much instruction as I felt was necessary to get an initial draft. And here we go, right? Now I've got a draft. Um, I'm not gonna be able to show you the entire syllabus because it's quite a long <laughs> result, a long syllabus, but this is the, the, the draft of the, the um, prompt that I gave it. I mentioned by the way, that it meets 15 times for one hour sessions, right? So I gave it as much information as possible. And now it gives me the, the full syllabus, right? A full draft of the syllabus, right? Because I've yet to do the iteration. I've yet to say, you know what, in week three, I wanna replace that. I wanna do something else in week five. I want to make sure to include this topic, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? I wanna add additional material. And then, and then of course, even then after that, that's still just a draft. Right now I can go in and, and now I've got a draft syllabus. I can refine, improve, customize, personalize, and, it, and it's my own work because it's all come from my initial um, idea and my refinement and my execution. I'm using the, the, the tool as a kind of advanced thesaurus, advanced dictionary, advanced word processing assistant, et cetera. It also helped me with this syllabus. So this is actually now a different tool. So now I'm, in this case, in this example, I'm using Bing, Bing AI. And I said, write me a syllabus for a five week course in entrepreneurial journalism. By the way, I chose this subject because I, I know the subject. So I, I know, you know, if it's going off bounds or if it's, um, it, I can kind of ensure that what I'm getting is, is re relevant and useful. And so it actually gave me a quite useful, quite useful draft syllabus, right? Again, in this case, I have my own syllabus. I don't necessarily need this, but when teaching new classes or when rethinking what I'm doing or teaching it in a very different context, I'm teaching different versions of it in three weeks or five weeks or one afternoon, this is really helpful. So it's giving me the course outline in addition to the learning outcomes and the course description. It's giving me some potential assignments. Um, it's giving me a week by week suggestion. It actually suggested one of my own video um, lectures that I've recorded is on YouTube, which is sort of interesting. Um, and, and it's giving me a, 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 a detailed outline of what I might include in the syllabus. Next, I might ask it to help with a lesson plan, right? Again, we're preparing for, for teaching in various different ways. So a lesson plan is something I'm really eager to have because I want to have a guide to make the most of every minute we have in teaching, right? Um, and and to, to make the classes enjoyable, to make the classes engaging, to make classes interactive, right? And planning out that detailed time frame of all the activities can be challenging, right? Can be time consuming and challenging. And sometimes I like to get new ideas, challenge my own assumptions about how I'm allocating time as a teacher. So here I gave it a, a question to, to assist me in crafting a detailed lesson plan for 170 minutes, right? Because that's a time block that is customary in my context for a workshop on design thinking. And this is specifically for a class focused on first year grad students, um, introducing them to the field of product design. Um, and I give some additional details, right? And, and specifically this session in particular, this class session is focused on creating new products respectfully for designing them for senior citizens, right? That That's kind of the, the, the idea in mind for this particular session, right? As an exercise, as a product a design activity. And so I tell them how many students, I tell the AI how many students in the class. I mentioned the 15 minute break. I want some activities in pairs, others in groups of four. What I want students to be able to do by the end of class. And it gives me a really detailed outline, right? And I actually have a PDF version of it now as well. Bing, um, can output a PDF of its results in a nice way. Um, and so this is the actual prompt. 
I want to reiterate the fact that not all prompts have to be this exhaustive or this detailed. You can start with something more simple and then iterate and say, actually, you know, the class is only this length, and then it will revise it and provide you an adjusted draft accordingly. Um, so this is the result. This is what the um, PDF looks like um, in the case of the PDF output. And again, it's a draft. So I'm going to refine it. I'm going to say, you know what? I don't want to spend as much time on empathy mapping. So I'm going to then edit that, change that, add a different element that I hadn't included. But to me, again, I'd love your, your sense of this, and you can feel free to chime in in the chat. To me, this is a good starting point. This is going to save me time. It's going to make the class more engaging and more creative because it's going to give me some new ideas about things I could do that I hadn't thought of. Or if I have thought of them, it's going to just put it in a nice format so I have a nice format ready to go and ready to use. Um, another example of a, a lesson plan just with a process. So I envision the learning outcomes and what I want to do. I summarize, right, for the AI, the essence of what this class is about. I give it some constraints, right? I said there are only 12 students. I want some activities in pairs. I want to include this and that, et cetera. Um, I, I give it the prompt and then I refine it, right? I iterate and I improve it. Um, and then I add some humanity to it. You know, maybe in my own version, I'm going to add some of my own language, my own text. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm going to add other material. Here's another example. This is on the history of journalism, a two-hour class I'm going to do. Um, and I'm getting some ideas for how to structure this or how to think about this. Um, and I'm asking it to include a mix of time spent on presentation material, discussion topics, activities, including brief case study, overview, et cetera. Right? These are things I know I want to include. So it's giving me a suggested kind of breakdown, a possible approach. And by the way, I can do this repeatedly. So I can say, give me a new approach. Give me a very different approach, right? Give me three different approaches I could try, right? So you can use it just like a thesaurus, again, expanding your possible creative output, expanding the ideas that you have, breaking through our assumptions and our biases and our limitations. Um, so it's giving me a few different suggestions. I actually hadn't thought in this case, uh, I hadn't thought about referencing ancient Roman China and specifically the advent of the printing press and that moment in the history of entrepreneurial journalism, right? I hadn't thought about sort of going back that far. So this was an example of like, oh yeah, that, that might be interesting for me to talk about, right? So that kind of gave me an idea to spark additional thinking and explore some new uh, idea I hadn't thought about including in my, in my session. So again, it's an idea partner, just as a great assistant or a great collaborator for you might give you new ideas. This can be, function as a collaborator, as an assistant that's sparking new ideas for you. By the way, I, I can ask it for um, specific things. So I can say, you know what, in the case study part, what are 10 examples throughout, um, throughout this period? And again, in this case, you can use the new BARD sort of checking, right? To make sure that the examples it's suggesting are actually factual, right, and real. Probably you're the subject domain expert, expert, so you're going to remember those. You're going to know that they're real or that they're not. Or if you're not sure, you're going to go and check. Um, but that can be another way of using it to drill down on a particular part of the class. Like we're going to have an ethical discussion as part of the class. What are 10 of the core ethical questions that are really worth debating? And how would you frame both points of view? So I could use that as a prompt and then choose one of those ethical uh, questions that it suggests. Starting from scratch can be stressful. You know, teaching is very hard. A lot of people burn out on teaching. They quit teaching. And we should be honest about that. And we all should recognize the fact that we are also sometimes overburdened. And again, there are many reasons to use AI in support of the work we do, um, including the ones I just mentioned, to augment our work, to make it even better. But it also we should, we should also acknowledge the fact that sometimes it can be really stressful if we are responsible for everything from scratch. And that's why we use a computer and not write everything by hand. And we do use spreadsheets and not put everything in old fashioned grid paper. And so I think we should think of this in the same kind of way. This is something that allows us to do more than we could otherwise do. Um, we can draft a rubric. So rubrics for me are hard to construct. I spent a lot of time on them. And this gives me a good starting point I can then refine. So this is a, a, an example where I was asking the rubric, uh, asking the AI for a first year undergraduate seminar on making effective informational presentations, right? This is a hypothetical. This isn't an actual class I'm teaching, just for example purposes. Uh, provide a draft of a detailed rubric for assessing a live presentation, right? That will help students understand the distinctions between presenting at an outstanding level, at an acceptable level, and at a level that would benefit from further effort and improvement. Include in the rubric concise language, reminding students of why these skills referenced are valuable. 
right? Um, so so in this case, it's giving me that that starting point. And then because it's Google, I can export to Sheets, right? So I can actually export it immediately to Sheets, which is kind of nice. And then I can refine it. I can say, you know what? Okay, that's good. But, you know, in the delivery area, please add more detail on X or Y, right? Um, so I can just use this as a starting point. Um, AI also, also helped me with this rubric. This is a more detailed one for entrepreneurial journalism ideas. And this is actually Bing AI. So again, there's not one company that has an exclusive uh, dominance on this. A lot of us think about ChatGPT, but a lot of these tools like Bard and Bing AI and Claude can also be quite, quite useful. So this is one that Bing AI did. And this time it's a four point rubric, right? Going from poor to excellent. And I gave it some criteria to focus on. Right, because I knew that these are the four core areas I wanted to focus on for this particular in-class activity. Okay. So this is another example of rubric. And notice it, it actually gives me the format of a rubric, right? So I can then build on it um, without having to create all of this from scratch. Okay. Now we're going to try a hands-on little hands-on activity. So I want you to have a chance. You mentioned many of you mentioned, I think three quarters of you mentioned you learn best by trying things. So I want to challenge you. I know in many cases we're in an online session. We we sit back and just listen. I want to challenge you to open up one of these four tools: ChatGPT, Bard, Claude, which is Claude.ai. Bard is Bard.google.com. ChatGPT you probably knows Chat.openai.com uh, or Bing AI. And and we should have the links uh, should be in there. Um, if not, you can uh, hopefully find them pretty easily. And what I want, what I what I want to encourage you to do is is try a, a simple beginning of a prompt that's relevant for something that you teach, right? I've given you a bunch of different kinds of examples for subjects that I teach, from classical music to writing to presenting to entrepreneurial journalism and so forth. But I want and, and product design. But I want to give you a chance to think about something that's relevant for you. So, um, so the example I want to I want to suggest. Well, you can pick one first of all, but I, I suggest you pick a, a lesson plan. Right. So you can start with a simple sentence like I'm teaching a 60 minute session on X. Right. Just a factual statement. I'm teaching a three hour workshop on Y. Right. I'm teaching an online session that will last 90 minutes about X. Right. About Z. whatever. Um, and 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 then and then give it give it a request. Right. Please help me. I like speaking in the way I would speak to a person. Um, just to be polite, but you don't have to. But um, please help me construct a less a detailed lesson plan, right? That will include dot dot dot, right? And this is where you can say some lecture time explaining X, right? Some discussion time focused on Y, right? An activity that will help students develop their skill at Z, right? And whatever other component. And then if you have additional constraints you want to give it, you can. But otherwise, you can just let it go, see what it comes up with, right? And and, and then and then prepare to iterate, OK? So let me give you a couple of minutes. I'm going to pause for a couple of minutes so you have a chance to work on that. And while I pause, I'm also going to take a look at questions. And I'll pause in a moment. Uh, I'll, I'll share a couple of responses to those questions in a moment. But first, I want to give you a moment for this hands-on activity.
Now I'd love to invite uh, one or two voices up to the fore. If you would put your hand up, if you'd like to share something you experimented with, something you tried, something you've um, you found might be an interesting point of exploration for you with this particular process of creating material, generating materials, generating drafts of, of teaching material. Somebody want to volunteer to share something? You can also share it in the chat if you're more comfortable doing that. That's fine. But I'd love to open up the space for, for at least one person to share. If you want to put your hand up, you can raise your digital hand with the reactions uh, tab, or you can unmute and We have a volunteer. Okay, Lana, thank you for raising your hand, being bold and joining us. Give us a quick summary, quick, quick comment, quick summary of what you did or what you used or what you tried or what you've, what you're so interested in. I, I think I'm gonna kind of uh, reflect on some of the ways I used it in the past, which for me was um, um, extreme saver of time. Um, I, had to, I had to create a test bank. Uh, based on some um, lecture, which was formatted in a PowerPoint presentation. So I utilized the slides to ask um, um, ChatGPT to create a multiple choice and multiple answers test bank. And right. it was huge. Uh, I did have to edit it, but I knew it was related to the content I taught in a definitely safe ton of time. So actually it was for a whole course. So in two days I created over 400 questions. Great, thank you for that. Um, that's a great point. And it's something um, I'll, I'll try to touch on briefly um, in, uh, in a moment and, and some upcoming slides, but I just wanna reiterate this idea that for generating questions, right? I don't know about all of you, but for me coming up with wrong answers can be time consuming, right? That are plausible wrong answers can be time consuming. So having it, um, giving it the question, having it come up with plausible wrong answers or having it, giving it the clear subject matter and the clear topic and the clear takeaways and then asking it to come up with the questions can be can be quite quite helpful, um, I find. Adam, do you have a quick, um, just a very quick comment or quick, uh, quick insight you wanna share? Adam uh, Sanchez, do you have a quick comment or, or, or uh, uh, insight you wanna share or example you wanna share? Sorry about I was on mute. I used um, Claude, and what I did was I looked some information on strokes, and then I looked for interventions, and it gave me a clear different uh, difference between medical interventions and therapeutic interventions from an occupational therapist's point of view and a physical therapist's point of view, which I found that very interesting, the way they broke it down. So thank you for that site. Sure, sure. And how would you use that in teaching context? It allows me to focus more on explaining the difference what a occupational therapist would bring to the table right. when working with a patient who's had a stroke and the difference that what a physical therapist would be bringing to the table when treating the same patient. Great. Thanks for that example. I'm going to, sh I'm going to share in a couple of moments, I'm going to move on to using uh, AI in class for coming up with examples or, or to prepare for life teaching. And ex generating examples and generating analogies is a great way to to use it. And that's it. You just give give us a good example of that. Um, and as the son of a neurologist who focuses on stroke, focused his life on stroke, I appreciate that particular uh, that that particular point that you shared, Adam. So thank you for that. Um, and one last one last comment, um, Dr. Catledge, Dr. Gwendolyn Catledge, um, if you could be as concise as possible in sharing your okay, insight. So I was really impressed. I use Bard. Um, because uh -huh. I've used a format before trying to look at things like epidemiology. And so I teach a course on social epidemiology. And so one of the things I asked it to do is to do a lesson plan looking at income disparities by age, age race, and gender. And we know that sometimes that interplays even more than the regular risk factors for disease. And I was really impressed with what it came up. And it mentioned some things that I was already using in class but gave some other ideas. So um, I think, you know, I'm thinking differently of AI after it generated something that was more appropriate for graduate students. Great. Thanks, Dr. Kylich. I really appreciate that example. And I'm, I, I really, I think it, it's helpful to hear from others, from a variety of people, because we start to see that our assumptions, there's a lot of assumptions people have about AI, and there's a lot of myths, and there's a lot of, um, 
kind of black and white thinking, we might call it, that it's all bad or it's going to save the world or it's going to ruin the world. Like, I think we need to be nuanced and we need to be real and practice trying things and seeing what it does and learning about the privacy terms, for example, how how is our information being used? How is it not being used? How can we erase our information and ensure that it's not being used uh, to train models, for example? I'm not going to get deep into that whole uh, ethical and privacy and security area. Um, I'll, I'll be happy to answer questions about it later. But there are many other people focusing on that. And I want to focus on kind of the day-to-day -day practical um, relevance for, for instructors and, and educators. But but I will say that that it it it's, it behooves us to dive into that right. We have to try things. We have to look at things. We have to read the terms. We have to experiment and try the tools rather than just looking at it in an abstract or vague or, or distant level or or just engaging in these in these um, discussions at a, at a broader level. Okay, I'm going to dive in further because we've got a lot more to to delve into. Um, I hope this is, you're finding this useful. Um, I, I'm happy to engage with people, by the way, afterwards. Um, in in uh, and I'll share my email for questions that that we don't get to in this live session. Okay, so now we're moving on to to this next section on augmenting live teaching. Um, before we do that, actually, I want to jump into another quick live uh, poll. So I'm actually going to. Um, to shift into a, a one more uh, quick poll uh, before we um, before we um, move into um, the next one, which is your um, favorite active favorite teaching tool for active teaching. So I'm gonna I'm gonna shift screens here, and I want to engage you in this Slido again. So what's some tool? I've been talking about a few different tools, AI tools, um, but maybe you have a different teaching tool. Um, we're going to focus on AI, AI today, but I just want to give you a chance to um, to uh, to mention another tool. There might be another tool, either an AI tool. I saw a couple of people mentioning AI tools in the chat. Um, so you can punch that into the, the Slido poll. Maybe there's another AI tool that you've used that I haven't mentioned, or just another kind of teaching tool that you find really useful in your, in your teaching. So I see Perplexity, which is a great AI search tool. Uh, polling tools like this one, like Slido. There's many others like Poll Everywhere and Mentimeter that others use. Um, mm -hmm is a great tool for presenting yourself visually on screen differently. That's a, a really great tool. Quizzes is an excellent tool for generating quiz questions. They have a new feature I just saw with quizzes where you can put in a YouTube link and it will generate quiz questions for the YouTube video, which is really interesting. Grammarly is a great tool for helping students who need help with grammar, particularly ESL students. Padlet is a phenomenal tool. I almost used Padlet today. Um, great tool for collecting ideas and, and insights from students. They're, they're uh, working on incorporating AI soon into Padlet in various ways. Um, Prezi is a great one um, for generating um, interactive kinds of presentations. Um, escape rooms, um, so many good tools here. Um, lots of good, good stuff for people. I'll, I'll try to include this in some follow-up materials afterwards as well for those who are interested. Uh, Canva, Jamboard is one I use almost every month um, in one way or another with students, kind of in how Google's whiteboard, digital whiteboard. Um, Kahoot is one I use almost every month for quiz questions in, in games, making class learning fun. Lots of good good um, tools here. Thank you for everyone who has shared a, um, a, a teaching tool. Um, and I'm also curious, for all of you, um, based on what we've we've said, well, I'll, I'll save that one for for later. Let's dive it back into the. I'll save the next one for for later. Thank you for those great um, great tool sharing, and I'm going to jump back into the slides. So we're augmenting live teaching. Um, we we've talked about generating materials, generating rubrics, and lesson plans, and syllabi, and learning outcomes. Now we're we're focusing on augmenting live teaching. One of the things is generating questions. That's already come up. AI can help us generate icebreakers, quiz questions, discussion questions, ethical questions worth debating, right? So it can, again, give us lots of ideas and we can choose from those ideas. Here's an example. I was leading a, a, a this is just a volunteering thing, a volunteer book group I lead for seniors. Um, we were discussing the book Bachan by Seki, great Japanese classic. And uh, I asked for some questions, right? I wanted to get my brain thinking in different ways. So I asked it for some questions that I might use in that uh, book group discussion. So that's an example of, of, of one context in which I could use it. Here's a, a tool called Quiz Gecko. So it, it, it can basically give you a, a, a set of questions to ask for formative assessments for, you know, check for understanding kinds of questions um, that, um, that you can use in, in teaching. You can paste in some text. So the answers are coming from you. It's not just from general AI or general web. You can paste in the text and then it's coming up with the questions 
based on what you've given it. So that's a nice, a nice tool for that. Uh, I love using the AI to generate examples. So here's an example. I, I, I'm just in a linguistic use case, right? What are examples of word pairs that sound similar in different languages, right? Um, that are otherwise in languages, but that are the languages are distant from one another, but the words sound similar, right? So the word for mama in, in English and Mandarin Chinese, um, or the word for bank in, in English and German. So this is a kind of example, generating examples of these word pairs, right? If I were teaching linguistics and I wanted to, to talk about how languages can sometimes work in parallel. Here's an example uh, uh, in an economics context. So act as an expert economist with broad knowledge of economics and economic theory, provide two examples of surprising ways in which the laws of supply and de demand can lead to price prices rising to levels that surprise consumers and two examples of surprising ways the laws of supply and de demand can lead to prices falling below what consumers might normally expect. So basically helping my, me, if I were teaching this, helping me to come up with some examples that I can use, right? And if I'm a subject matter expert, I can correct these or adjust these or, or build on these, right? Much in the way that, that Dr. Catledge um, applied this in her own context as a, as a physician um, or, or, or uh, David did in the context of, of his um, comment earlier about physical therapy. In addition to examples, we can have it generate analogies. Analogies, uh, we don't have time to go into the pedagogical theory behind this, but analogies are very powerful, right? We kind of know this intuitively. When we want to explain something to someone, right? We want to explain the movie Aliens to someone. We could give them, you know, 500 words explaining, you know, this, uh, this actress whose name I'm forgetting goes onto a spaceship and she does this and this, or we could say it's Jaws on the spaceship, right? We can give people analogies to help explain complicated things in a very simple way, right? And so he, here are a couple examples. I, I asked, um, in this case, ChatGPT, act as an expert in explaining complex scientific concepts in simple, clear ways for the benefit of those interested in learning. What analogies might help me explain elements of nuclear fusion, which by the way, I don't claim to understand, or it's not my area of expertise. Maybe some of you can explain it um, to others here. Um, to a group of first and second year college students who are passionate about football, basketball, and other major college sports, right? So we're taking something and putting it into a very different context for college students to make it more accessible and relatable and exciting and interesting. And it's telling me the basic concept of fusion, football anal analogy, right? Imagine two football players running towards each other at full speed. When they combine, when they collide, they combine their energy and momentum, resulting in a massive impact, right? Similarly, in nuclear fusion, two atomic nuclei come together with so much energy, they combine to form a new, heavier nucleus, right? And now we've got an image in people's mind that they can start to bring to life. This idea, this abstract concept now feels visual, right? Our brain is constructing an image based on this analogy that's helping us, helping this concept come to life. That's what teaching can do, right? And we are teaching this concept, but we're using the AI to help us teach it in a more vibrant, interactive, creative way, right? By coming up with these creative analogies. Maybe we don't like that one. Maybe we want to use the basketball one instead, or maybe we want to use the football touchdown analogy instead, right? We've got lots of material here. We can pick pick and choose what, what's relevant for our teaching. Uh, we can use the AI to dream up new activities in class, right? We can say, you know, I want to use Post-its and I want to create an activity where people are coming up with their own ideas. And uh, and I want to have people in small groups, and I, I want them to come away with a, a new understanding of the complexities or the nuances of issue X or Y, right? Well, what are what are five in class activities that would take about fifteen minutes that I could try, right? So it can actually surprisingly come up with five really good activities, right? And 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 then you can say, give me the instructions that I can use in class, right? Help me, give me instructions and give it to me in English and in Spanish, because I have some English language learners who might help, it might help to have that instruction in Spanish or in Chinese or in Arabic or in whatever other language. So you can really be creative about how you use it to apply in your particular context, right? We have a whiteboard and I would like to use the whiteboard for this. We don't have much space for, for post-its. Can you give me an alternative way of doing this using the whiteboard? Um, and having students, you know, take turns at the whiteboard or something. You can really think about ways of using it that apply to your circumstances. And we give the we give the AI the context. We set the context, right? Like tell them about the size of the classroom or the number of students or the length of time. 
And then we, I'm telling, you know, this is actually a flipped class. So this is the context, right? Or, or this is a hybrid class. Some students are gonna be dialing in remote. Please include instructions I can use with the remote students, right? And don't get me started on dealing with those two sets of students at once. I find that really challenging. Uh, what about, this is a student-led class. So I want students to, to take ownership of this, um, you know, help me set the context in that way when I'm designing this activity. Or, or this is a workshop and, and so forth. So you can set the context in whatever kind of class you might be teaching. So it's aligning with your pedagogy, your style, your approach. Similarly, we can set the objective. I want students to be able to collaborate. I want, I want to make sure that students have a chance to practice presenting. I want students to, to debate the pros and cons, or I want students to come away with a sense of three ways to refine their writing, right? Whatever, whatever your objective is, you're setting that and you're guiding the AI to help you in achieving that objective by providing the context and the objective. You can use the AI to, to translate materials. So there's a lot of material being um, developed and distributed in lots of different languages. We often have a bias towards our own language. Maybe we can expand by looking at more materials, whether it's pedagogical research, whether it's reports and research in our field of expertise, whatever it is. We can also use translation in another way, which is to say, if we have English language learners or people who may not be fully strong in, in all elements in English yet, we can provide quick translations for them of the syllabus or of our agenda for the day or of a handout, right? Of our materials, any or of our presentation material, right? All of that we can translate in a matter of minutes, right? And and or a matter of seconds in some cases, right? Um, and so we, we should ask ourselves if that might help some of our students or if we're not doing it, why we aren't doing it and what we forego when we don't do it. Um, we can transcribe and summarize our class sessions. So again, for students who have visual impairments or auditory impairments or physical impairments or can't attend class for personal reasons or they have a death in the family or, or they have trouble understanding or they're neurodivergent or all sorts of other circumstances, right? We have many different kinds of students and many different kinds of circumstances. And we can have the AI transcribe a session. We can have the AI summarize the session. Um, I just did this this week for a couple of my students who had um, really um, difficult personal circumstances, um, I was able to transcribe a class session that they couldn't attend and summarize it for them and provide them all of that material so that they could make up the work more efficiently. They wanted to make up the work and I wanted to help them do that. So, so that this is a tool you can use. I have a tool I use on my computer called Blocks, B-L-O-K-S dot app. And what it does is record either in-person meetings um, and obviously only with the permission of the person I'm meeting with, right? Of course, we ask for permission, make sure people are okay with it. And with the permission of students and, and people I'm meeting with, it will record and then summarize that session, right? And uh, it, because it lives on my laptop, it can be an in-person session or it can be a remote session. Um, it can record and then summarize that material. And I can share that summary with the students, right? Rather than spending half an hour writing out my own summary, I can take that and I can edit it. And then I can provide it to students afterwards or to a colleague I've been meeting with or to people in my committee in a meeting, right? By the way, I can also query that. I can say, give me the five most important action steps I need to take, right? So I can query it just like I would query anything else um, in AI. So that's an example of an efficiency and also a matter of inclusion, right? Supporting students and helping students who might otherwise be excluded or, or unable to participate. Um, I think I think we'll do a quick a quick hands on here, which is to say in the chat, in the chat, I'd love you to drop a quick thought on one of the ways in which you could use one of these um, techniques that we've been talking about for engaging teaching. So, for generating an analogy. What's the subject you would generate analogies for, or a, a principle, or a concept, or a framework that you would generate analogies for, or examples of? You could put that in the chat. That might help spark ideas from other people who are here. Okay. So, what's an example of something that a concept, a framework, an idea, a principle, something that you teach in your class, uh, or something you find yourself having to explain, or that you know that you would like to have explained? Um, a concept that you would use AI to generate examples for or analogies for. Um, and uh, and just share share a quick comment in the chat on that. Um, if you want to, if you if you have your chat GPT open or your Claude or your Bard open, feel free to try something out too for the next uh, minute or so um, as we do this this second uh, kind of hands-on thing. 
And then we're going to move, I'm going to share a little bit about multimedia and a few other ways of using AI um, for enhancing our, our teaching, empowering us as educators. And then we'll open up for a Q&A in, in not too long. But first, let's see some of your input in the in the chat. Yep, so I see an example of an activity. Somebody has just added analogy. One analogy for gender is like the falling. Yeah, there's a good example, passive network scanning. So there's an analogy that explains that. Um, neuroplasticity, reconceptualism. I, I do not know that term. So I need an analogy or an example of that. <laughs> um, great. So good, good, good. Uh, some good examples, some good ideas coming in here. Uh, someone teaching child development could ask for an analogy for assimilation and accommodation. Great. So fundamentalism. Yeah, these are really interesting concepts that would be great to have analogies for examples of elaborations of, you know, and by the way, analogies and examples are just two things, right? You could also ask it to, to, to look at how this uh, concept is, is um, viewed differently from different fields of study, right? Or from different perspectives. What are different perspectives on this concept or different definitions or different kinds of definitions? Or what are areas of disagreement about this concept? You know, there's all sorts of ways of kind of using it to expand the way you're thinking about how you teach a particular concept or principle. Okay, onward so that we have uh, time for questions at the end. Um, summarizing feedback. I don't know how often you get feedback from students, um, but I often get feedback at the end of a term from students and I wanna summarize that. So I can take a column, right, on a, on a spreadsheet, for example, right, and paste that in and get a summary of what are the key points that people are saying, right? What are the things that I should be aware of and that I should be noticing? Now, I could read, you know, 100 different or 200 different comments and try to make sense of that myself. And I generally do that myself anyway, but it might also help to say, you know what, here are three themes that are coming up in this feedback. These are things that students really appreciate. These are things that they're wondering about, right? Here's a potential adjustment you could make, right? So I can do that simply by pasting in that column Right, of responses to that question and say, summarize this and give me some action points, give me some of the things that people are finding helpful and some of the things that people um, might like adjusted um, for future terms, right? So that's an interesting way of using uh, AI. Um, and, and it's finding patterns, it's finding themes um, among this, this student feedback, for example. We can also coach students. I'm, I, again, I'm not focusing too much on how students are using it. I saw a couple of questions in there and, and I'll try to address them in the Q&A. But we can coach students on prompting for specific feedback. So if we have a large class, for example, and we're not able to give personalized, detailed, one-on-one -on -one feedback to every single student on every single draft, right? we can encourage them to try to get some input and some feedback. Um, and it can help them identify blind spots, probe their own thinking. right? What have I ignored in my writing? right? What have I not covered in this paragraph right? on this issue? I'm summarizing this issue, but I've left something out possibly, what was that, right? Or what's a sentence that's really flabby in my own writing, right? These are all things that students can do. We can do in our own writing as well, right? We can say, this is a paragraph I've just written. How can I take out some of the flab? How could I make this less jargon filled? So that's another way of using AI to improve and strengthen our communication, our writing, either ours as educators or our students. Um, and, and we can encourage students to think about it as an editing tool and editing assistant, much like they would use Grammarly or a thesaurus or a dictionary or Fowler's modern guide to English language usage. I was lucky enough to have a class with um, John McPhee when I was a college student and he would have Fowler's guide to modern English language on his desk, right? That was one of the things that he used in, in teaching um, with us when sitting down and focusing on our writing. We can give AI a prompt to be a writing coach for us right? Or our students can, right? You're an expert in writing researching. Um, you've helped many people. Your task is now to teach me how to do this effectively, right? Always include a question that helps me better understand. Did you understand, right? We can give it a, a language to help us, help it coach us 
through the process or help a student coach um, use it to coach him him or her through the process. Um, and and we can um, we can ask it to help us think through what are some pros and cons. Um, uh, and and students can use this when they're they're ensuring that they don't have blind spots. They haven't forgotten some possible considerations or arguments. It can help ESL students get immediate feedback, right? This is something from um, Dr. Philippa Hardman, who I like um, from Cambridge University, has some good insight on this. And she gives this example of how, or this point about how the feedback that students can get is immediate. It's individual. So it's about their specific essay. It's actionable. It gives them something specific they can do. It's motivating because it gives them some encouragement, right? Depending on the, the prompt. And it's succinct. So in a short period of time, they can get some input on something they're working on. Now, I'm not suggesting in any way that this replace our feedback. Of course not. We are the teachers. We give feedback. However, when students are working day to day, hour by hour on their own, as particularly if we have a large class, we may not have the time to work with every student, as I said, on every single draft of their essay. So students will inevitably um, want to be using tools. And this is a constructive way to use the tool not to write their material for them, but to help them with the editing process with some feedback. They can also use it on an individual basis. Here's a, here's a, an example. This is a, a tool called DeepL where um, we actually don't have the GIF showing, but basically what this will do is it'll, if you highlight a sentence, it will give you five different options of how to write that sentence or how you might rewrite that individual sentence. So this is about helping students develop some of their own skill at coaching themselves and, and getting feedback themselves. Um, we talked about these summaries. This is an example of a, of a meeting. This is an actual summary. So this was a meeting I had and or a presentation I had, and this is giving me a summary of the, of the material that I presented. Um, when we're using AI, um, it can help us come up with different kinds of assessments, right? So again, not using the AI to do the assessment, that's not what I'm suggesting. I'm saying we can use the AI to help us come up with assessments. So we can say, for example, that we're gonna generate some kind of assessment that asks students to annotate an AI response. So we know that students are gonna use AI. So what about if we tell them to use AI, okay, for this particular question, use AI, but then annotate it, comment on it, point out what's missing, point out what the AI doesn't know that you know, or, or point out how you, your view um, adds on to or differs from the AI, right? Um, we can um, ask the students to, we can give, give the AI a prompt to help us ask the students to teach each other something um, or ask the students to teach the AI something and ask the AI to act as the student in a way. Um, so there's lots of different ways we can, we can um, use AI in strengthening the kinds of assessments we use, we can even have students critique the AI, AI responses, right? We can show the, the two responses and ask the students to, to critique those responses. Um, this issue of cheating will not go away. Um, as I said, I'm not gonna focus on that today. Students will circumvent our efforts to use, you know, turnitin.com or, or all these other um, tools that, that now exist. So that's not gonna go away. It's gonna to continue to be a problem. It's a little bit outside the scope of today to, to address that fully. Um, but, but what I do wanna say though, is that we should focus on the learning process, right? So the assignments should help students develop their own skills at learning, right? Help them think about the skill, developing the skill, the meta skills of reflection, critical thinking, creativity, right? Um, the AI cannot do those things in place of students, right? So we want to make sure that the kinds of assessments we're giving students give them the opportunity to do those kinds of critical thinking activities. When we're asking students to debate, to explain, right, to present, those are things they're going to have to do in class in many cases, or they're going to record themselves doing out of class. And those are things that the AI cannot do for them. So those are the kinds of assessments we want to move towards. Um, project-based AI, that project-based assessments, project-based activities that the AI cannot do in place of students. Um, and this is, I asked a, a, an, a, an expert, Ken O'Connor, about this subject and, and you know, what, what's, what's okay with students to use from his perspective? Is it okay to have students work on editing with AI's help? He said, anything that helps students improve their writing before the final product is positive. So if AI can give useful, actionable, personalized feedback, then he thinks it should be used. 
Okay, that's his point of view and different people may feel differently. But of course we have to remind students about academic integrity, remind them of the boundaries and so forth and so on. Um, there's many different multimedia tools we can use. This is gonna be the last bit of information we'll separate into, uh, we'll move into, um, we'll move into Q and A after this. Um, Beautiful.ai is a tool I use to create many of these slides. It uh, can create slides for you actually. <laughs> Um, based on your prompts, based on your materials, it can also just help you improve existing slides. So you get you have a slide, you want to add something, change the font, it easily does it for you. It's much more effective and visually engaging than PowerPoint slides. And when you add something to a slide, like you'll see me do in a moment, it will automatically move things around for you. So if you have two or three items on a, on a slide like this one, you add a fourth, everything will move around for you automatically. If you have four um, points of numbers, you want to turn them in a different direction, you, it'll do that for you. Uh, Gamma is another one. It will help you generate AI uh, generated slides on a particular prompt that you give it. Um, uh, don't have time to show this in depth, um, but but um, this is another tool. If you want to explore, um, you can. This is a little, little brief example. So you can see that you can change the color and you can change different elements of that. You can use AI to help you with charts. Um, there's something called Whimsical. It's a plugin for ChatGPT Pro. I saw someone in the chat mention ChatGPT Pro. Um, Whimsical is an example of a plugin, and there are many others. There's hundreds of plugins. And what you can do with Whimsical, which is a design tool, a diagramming tool, is you can say, I want a diagram of a complex organization with a CEO and three senior level leaders and blah, 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 blah. Draw me a flow chart of that that I can show to illustrate this um, structure of a business organization to students. And it will actually, ChatGPT will understand the language, will send that request to Whimsical. Whimsical will produce the actual draft visual and then give it to you. And you can now edit it and improve it, but you don't have to create it from scratch. And you can do that with charts and graphs as well. So there's really some really interesting new things you can do. Um, you can create video, um, little short video, explanatory videos. Um, yeah, I won't, I won't show this because of time, but there's just some remarkable new tools appearing if you do use multimedia in your teaching. Um, tools like Capwing enable you now to create really creative, interesting new, new AI. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, and there's many, many others. Um, Descript, if you're creating audio materials for students or you wanna create a podcast version of your class, um, Descript lets you do that without having to know anything about audio editing. You just edit the text much like you would edit a Word document or a Google doc. Um, very easy to use. It allows you to, to export audio. You can even use it for video. Um, it's really powerful. It's a fantastic, relatively easy to use tool. And it can help you as an as a educator who may not be a professional multimedia person, you can now suddenly be creating video and or audio for, for students, um, whether you're teaching an asynchronous class or for giving creating a trailer for your class. There's all sorts of uses for, for that. Um, and ultimately, you're going to have more impact as an instructor in many different ways um, by, by using these tools, by exploring how AI can be, can be helpful to you. Um, you're going to generate more engaging materials. You're going to add images. You're going to use AI for, for um, creating images if you're interested. Tools like Midjourney and Dolly. And Canva has AI built into it now, right, for generating images that you can put into your slide deck, even if you're not using the AI for slides. Let's say you're still using PowerPoint. You can just generate an individual image with Canva now, and you give it an instruction. And you say, I'm, I'm teaching a class about the decline of social media, and um, I want an image of a bird cage breaking and the bird falling out of the bird cage, because I'm going to talk about the decline of Twitter, for example, right? And it will give you an image that you can then immediately use in your, and that's your image. You've, you've co-designed it in the same way that we use Photoshop or Illustrator or something else. Um, it can create diagrams. The tool, by the way, somebody asked about um, charts. Um, the, the, one of the tools is called Whimsical. 
There's another tool. These are these are ChatGPT Pro plugins. Another one is called Daygram, which is a strange name. It's the word diagram with the A and the I flipped. I don't know why they named it that. Um, but um, any questions you have, by the way, something I've said, feel free to email me afterwards. Um, I will answer emails um, uh, afterwards with questions that um, are clarification questions. Um, and I'm putting my email in here, jeremy at jeremykaplan.com. Um, and slides we've talked about just engaged students. I can't tell you how many classes I've observed where teachers are using terrible PowerPoint slides, just boring and dull and dense and full of jargon and no images and too much text. And you can use AI tools to help you do that even if you're not a design professional. Um, audio tools like, like uh, Adobe Podcast is a new tool, Descript is one I mentioned. Those tools remove background noise. They remove your filler words. They make your audio sound good, actually, even if you don't have a professional audio setup. Very easy to use. So all of these tools can help you create multimedia and make your teaching material more, more engaging. If you're looking for new AI tools to try, we've talked about some in the realm of these interactive, um, iterative chat tools like ChatGPT and, and Bard and Bing AI and Claude. If you're looking more broadly, these are some other tools that I really recommend that have AI elements built in that are useful for a whole range of different kinds of productivity. Ultimately, our goal is to open up time for human interaction expand the ways in which we teach creatively and make our teaching more impactful in service of our students, right? That's really what our ultimate objective is. And all of these resources and approaches and tools are in service of that end objective, right? That's really what we're aiming for. And with that, I will be happy to take your questions, try to address some of the, the questions you have. Um, my name is Jeremy Kaplan. You can reach me at that email address. You can find out more about this, uh, these subjects, these tools, um, my newsletter, Wonder Tools, which I've mentioned. I'm also gonna be hosting a, a, a little mini course for people who are really interested in this subject, a very small group of people. If you're interested in that, you can email me and express interest and I'll be happy to share more, more info about that. There's also an ebook, which I've written, which is a short, concise guide, hopefully useful, which includes many of the examples I've referenced today. Hopefully that will be a useful follow-up for you as well. And the main encouragement I have for you today, leaving this, is to take action. Try something. One thing. Pick one thing. I know it can be a, a lot of new things for some people if you haven't done all of this before. But I want to encourage you just to pick one thing that you're going to try and set aside some time. Carve out some time. Make a point of putting a time on your calendar. Not just an abstract idea, but putting time on your calendar to try one specific thing. And with that, I want to ask you for a takeaway. What's one takeaway? for you from today that's in the that's in the um in the slido and uh and with that i'll also turn to the questions so we're now in the in the q a part of the 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 um session and i would love to hear your takeaways in the in the slido poll and then your questions um i'll look at the q a and i will also um be happy to take questions you have out loud you can raise your voice and share share your um, your comments, I mean, share your questions. Um, share your comments too, but share your share your questions. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the Q&A now and the, uh, the, course, the great Coursera team, thank you for hosting this by the way and for being a, a great platform for, for helping educators to do their best work. And so thanks to the Coursera team for, for hosting this and making this possible. And, and, and if, there, if on the Coursera team, if there are things that I should address that you've seen that I haven't noticed, please uh, feel free to chime in and, and let me know. Um, and I'll start out by addressing a couple of questions um, that I see here. Um, are all of these media sites subscription-based? So many of the tools I mentioned are free. Some of them are freemium, meaning that, for example, with ChatGPT, you can use it completely for free, but if you want to use the plugins, that requires a subscription, which is not cheap. It's $20 a month. So that's not, not, not a freebie. But the free version does most of what we've talked about. Bard is completely free from Google. And Bard has new extensions, meaning that it can now search something in your Google Docs or your Google Drive or your um, Gmail. Um, so you can use it in new ways. 
or it can export to a, to a sheet. So Bard is completely free. Bing AI is completely free. Claude at the moment is completely free. So many of these tools are completely free. And some of them, like Canva AI, is also um, a freemium product, right? So you can use some of it free and some of it you have to pay for. Um, how to use ChatGPT plugins, someone asked about. So basically, when you go into um, ChatGPT, there's an area where you can uh, basically choose which particular element you want to use in answering a question, one of which is the plugins, and then you choose which plugins you want to use. Um, can you copy and paste an existing PowerPoint presentation into Beautiful AI? You can import a presentation, yes, into Beautiful AI. How can you prioritize which ones are worth paying for without having to pay to subscribe to 10 different things? So my approach is, first of all, we do need multiple tools, right? Just like you need, need multiple pans in your kitchen. You can't just have one pot that cooks every possible type of food imaginable, right? At least I can't. Um, you need different tools for different purposes, right? And you don't have one tool in your toolbox. It's not just a hammer that will fix everything in your house or apartment, right? At least not in mine. Um, so, so we need multiple tools, but you can prioritize the tools based on your needs. So here are three objectives, right? Let's say I have three objectives. I want to create more visual material. I know that's an objective of mine, right? Then I want to find a tool, which tool can help me with that particular objective, right? Or, or whatever it is that you want to do. And so I would base the, the tool on what your need is. Right. And then among those needs, among those, so let's say you want something that's going to make things more visual, uh, find three options and choose between those three options. Try them out, see which resonates with you and choose in that, in that manner. Students don't need to download Beautiful at AI. It's, it's, um, it's like Google Slides. It's just a web-based slide tool. So you can use the Beautiful AI to create your own slides. And then you can export it as a PDF, or you can even export it as a PowerPoint file, if you're used to using PowerPoint, or export it as a set of images. Um, and you just present it from your own computer, just as you would present any slide presentation, right? Um, students don't have to touch it in any way. If you want to send students the presentation, you can send them a PDF, or you can even send them a link to the presentation. So that's how beautiful AI works, just like Google Slides, for example. Someone asked at the early part of the meeting about generative AI tools using huge amounts of water um, and power. That's not an area I have expertise in, so I, I won't claim to, to be an expert in that area. I think with a lot of things we use, we use Google. Google consumes a lot of energy, right? A lot of the web actually consumes a lot of energy um, and has a climate impact. Um, that's a subject that people are beginning to, to do research in and explore. As I said, I'm not an expert, so I won't claim to have any particular insight into that, other than to say that, you know, I think if if we want to apply a climate crisis frame to a lot of what we do, there's a lot of different areas we can look at, um, including you know the, the power structures that are driving the web, um, as well as the power structures that are driving Web3 and cryptocurrency. Um, but most importantly, we should start by focusing on the oil and gas industry, which as Al Gore talked about in his recent TED talk is, is really the, the most prominent area of, of focus in the realm of, of that kind of um, consumption. Of, uh, of resources. I'll leave it, I'll leave it at that. Um, and that's my personal take, by the way, as I said. So I preface that by saying that's not my, my focus area. Um, other questions, what questions do you have? Put, let's, let's have human real out loud questions. What's some question you, you have in this last bit of time? What's something you want me to address that I didn't address? Something that you'd like me to clarify? Something you'd like to uh, me to elaborate on in some way in our final Final moments together here. Um, Jeremy? Yes, please, go ahead. Be as concise as possible if you can. Yes, you mentioned one of the, um, one of the um, uh, resources that could handle, I think you said 7,000 words as input. Was that Claude or which one yes. was that? Yes, Claude, yes. Okay, thank seven, you so much. 70,000. 70,000, 70,000 70, yeah. 70, words. 70, yes, yes. They, they actually you. measure in terms of tokens, which is sort of a, a, a jargony way of, of measuring things from the AI world. So they actually, it's it's 100,000 tokens, I believe, which about amounts to about 70,000 words, which means basically the length of, of some books, right? Which is pretty powerful. I mean, if you think about what that can mean, um, you can compile a lot of material and then put it into Claude 
Um, and I, I've done this, for example, with a transcript. So I've had a session where I, I put in the entire transcript and then said to Claude, what were the five main points I made? Or what were five of the key quotes that I, I said? Or what were five of the most common questions people asked? And the transcript can be quite long, right? If it's an hour long or a session like this, for example, an hour and a half long. So there's a lot of use cases where it's helpful to be able to have it analyze all that information, then be able to ask it questions. So I want to learn about this new subject. Here's a PDF. Here's a document that's extremely long and detailed and complicated. Walk me through it. What are some of the key points here? In, in a sentence, teach, talk to me like I'm five, right? You know that concept? T teach me like I'm five. What is this scientific study really saying? Explain it to me. Give me some of the analogies. What are some of the key quotes? There's so many things you can do. It's basically like having a living teacher in the machine, right? Who's going to guide you through and be patient and answer all of your questions based on that material. And what I want to be clear about is this is not the case where it's going out to the web and making up its own answers. It's telling you based on what's in this document, right? Which is a really important distinction. So it's not hallucinating. It's drawing from the document itself. And, and similarly, you can put your own documents in there. You can say, this is these are the past five papers I've written on this topic. I'm trying to teach a new class. What are five of the core notions I should make sure to include from my own writing, from my own past research, from my own notes, right? That's really powerful. We've just begun to unlock the power of AI, right? We're at the very early stages. We can ask AI, there's a tool called mem.ai. We can use it for our notes. We can query it. We can ask questions of our own notes. Again, it's not searching Google. It's not looking on the web. It's looking in our own notes. And we can say, what are my thoughts on this topic that I've written about? Or what did this person I talked to? I talked to three different people on this subject. What were the things they shared in common? And what were the differences in their point of view? There's just incredible things we can do in unlocking our own insights, organizing our own notes that we can do with AI. OK, we're running out of time. So I'll take a question from Geraldine. Thanks yes, for that. Thank question, you. Uh, quick question. Can you, I know you did already, but can you say a little bit more about those um, about assignments and in-class activities that can help students to use these meta critical thinking skills, especially in humanities courses, uh, and integrate AI in a in a productive way? So not cheating, but a productive way. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these things that we've been saying we can do as educators, students can do, right? So we can encourage students to dialogue with the AI and say, what are the five different points of view on this issue of whatever, whatever concept it is and whatever field it is, right? So um, we can we can tell the students, you know, give the AI a sentence or three sentences that summarize your perspective and ask the AI to play the role of a devil's advocate or ask the AI to counter your viewpoint. What does the AI say? Or ask the AI to, to, to give you a, a, a criticism, to act as a critic and say, if what would a critic, I often do this for my own writing, by the way, I say, what would a critic say I've left out? What would a critic say is weak about this newsletter post? Or what would a what would someone who disagrees with me point out that I've forgotten to include, right? And students can do that as well. And 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 that's one thing. Another thing is um, students can use the AI to basically compare the real work versus the AI work, right? And we can do this too. So here's a piece by Toni Morrison, right? Here's a beautiful passage from Beloved by, by Toni Morrison or Jazz by Toni Morrison, right? Or Song of Solomon by Toni Morrison. What now, now, and then ask the AI to output a paragraph in the in the style of Toni Morrison, right? And now let's put these two things side by side. What is the AI missing? What is it about the human voice of Toni Morrison that really sings? And, and what has the AI left out? Or what doesn't the AI quite, or, or what is the AI trying to do? Which are the elements of Toni Morrison's writing style is the AI trying to replicate or trying to imitate or trying to simulate, right? That's kind of an interesting question for students to wrestle with, right? And we're getting into the nuances of, of what the AI is, is doing, which is, which is, I think, kind of, kind of fun. Other, other, uh, other final questions here. Something else you're, you're curious about, something else that um, I should address that I haven't in our final moments here. I had one. Yes, please. I was just wondering about um, referencing that AI was used to generate your content. I mean, now we're talking about start, you know, to start with, and then you've got the hands-on um, evolutions of it. But I mean... Um, what do you need to document that it was somehow um, 
somehow AI was used? Yeah, that's a great question. So my my instinct is to be as transparent as possible when it's relevant. So we don't say, for example, I use Microsoft Word to draft this, or I use Google Docs to draft this, right? So because that's not super relevant, it doesn't influence the, the thing. If I if I make slides with PowerPoint or Keynote or beautiful.ai, people don't necessarily care what tool I'm using to make the slides, for example, right? So in those cases, I don't think it's helpful. If you are using it in a context whereby you are using the actual language from the AI, for example, like if I we're presenting this example that I mentioned a moment ago of, of uh, Toni Morrison's actual language. Like here's an actual excerpt from one of her books and here's an excerpt from open, you know, from ChatGPT. Then I would certainly say this is an excerpt from ChatGPT um, so that it's clear to students, you know, what, what was, where it came from or clear to anyone where it came from and what it was for. Um, and if I'm using an Im image uh, or video, that's generated by AI. Absolutely. In those cases, would I say this was generated with AI or by AI or with collaboration with AI? Absolutely. In that case, right? That's something I would absolutely, um, absolutely do. Um, so, so th that's kind of my general feeling. If with audio, there's a little bit of um, difference of opinion among people in the audio profession. Like this audio has been cleaned up with AI. You might want to say that. If you feel like it's it's you know something that people would wonder, how is the audio so clean? Um, but in general, those are some of the thoughts that I would I would have. Thank you. I hate to step in here and and and, and end this. This has been a fantastic session, um, but I do but I do need to be aware of the time. So um, thank you so much, Jeremy, for for this session. This was this was incredibly informative um, and and so useful. I know there's been so many comments um, in the in the chat about how incredibly useful this has been. So thank you so much for your time, and, and hopefully we'll we'll get to have you back again at some point. Thanks, Sean, and thanks everyone for coming. If I can be helpful to you or collaborate with any of you who are here who are interested in this topic, feel free to reach out. You got my email. I'm happy to, to reach out, be useful to you or your colleagues and, and answer questions if I can. And hopefully the materials you'll get afterwards will help follow up. And, and again, I encourage you to dive in and, and explore and, and share your results. If you find something that's really useful for you, I'd love to hear about it, share it with you, share it, share it with me and, and, uh, and, and we'll be on the journey together. Thank you.